Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Sorry, Nicola, I pinned you just a little too soon. I'm gonna I'm gonna take you off spotlight for just a second. Let you. Um, good evening. Um, good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from in the world. Uh, my name is Ian Gavigan. I am the general coordinator for the Hilo Winter 2022 Summit. I'm also an executive counselor at Rutgers AUPAFT the Union of Graduate Student Workers, full-time faculty, librarians, postdocs, and EOF counselors at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, um, where I'm a graduate student. Uh, I'm also here as a member of Scholars for New Deal for Higher Education, but most importantly, I'm here because we've, uh, we're have we concluding um, a powerful four-day summit, the second national summit led uh, by HILU, which is Higher Ed Labor United. We are a national coalition of higher education labor union locals, AUP advocacy chapters, and voluntary uh, membership-based organizations of higher education workers uh, in, in every state, uh, building a wall-to-wall, -wall, coast to coast movement, as we call it. We have just come off of a really powerful vote of affirmation from our, from our um, uh, conference participants, um, affirming a statement and a plan for building out his long-term organizing structure focused on three core program areas, which are quite excitingly uh, uh, grounded in coordinated organizing across our campuses to make sure that all of us are moving in the same direction uh, as we fight for union recognition in bargaining campaigns, in work actions, and in all of the ways we're fighting on our campuses and across our campuses for, um, for the higher ed system that we, that we uh, want and need. Uh, our second major area is in policy development and advocacy to make sure that it's higher education workers and our organizations that are setting the stage and writing legislation and regulation from the local all the way to the federal level um, to transform the uh, to transform our systems on uh, on the fronts that we can't uh, at the bargaining table. And finally, is political engagement and organizing, um, which is focused on building building political power uh, across our movements to make sure that we can not only fight for but win uh, win the things we need. So I want to give a quick thank you to our whole coordinating committee. Um, I don't know, Sean, if we can get everyone spotlighted real quick. Um, but we've got uh, Naomi Wilkin, our phenomenal program coordinator. Thank you, Naomi. Um, Naomi has been the reason we've had these amazing plenary sessions in, in addition to everything. So thank you, Naomi, for your work. Um, also on our program committee are Trent McDonald and Ariana Jacob. Trent has led our policy, uh, both the policy and the national coordinator organizing, also known as NCOC. Uh, Ariana has led our political organizing work. So thank you to the to the two of you. Um, we also have Sean O'Brien, our logistics coordinator. Thank you, Sean. He's kept the Zoom running. Uh, the multiple crazy, you know, it's it's been a lot. So thank you. Um, we have Jewel Tomasula, who has been the fearless outreach leader. Uh, bringing so many voices, new and new and uh, and and wise uh, and, and experienced to the table alike. So thank you, Jewel, and Tracy Berger, the media and communications coordinator, who's just gotten gotten everything communicated that needed to be, uh, so that we could all be here. So thank you, everyone. It's been an incredible group to work with. Each one of us is a leader in our own union, local as ad workers adjunct and contingent faculty, professional staff, and tenure and tenure stream faculty on this committee, all working together and moving in the same direction. Um, and so we try to replicate the intention and the and and the real commitments of our of our of our coalition in in the work that we did. So thank you for everyone for putting up with us and our facilitation. Um, and I don't I don't want to take up too much more time, but I do want to bring up we have we have a first panel um, which are two incredible union leaders uh, at the core of our movement. Um, first, first, who's going to speak is is Nicola Walters of CFA, and uh, after after Nicola, um, leading into our keynote speaker is going to be Fred Cole, the president of uh, UUP, the largest higher ed uh, labor union in the country. So, um, I just want to invite the two of you to speak um, uh, on what this summit, what its outcomes 
what the promise of Hilu means to you and your unions, um, and to speak about what's what's next, uh, what's next for us. So Nicola, I invite you to go first, and then we'll we'll follow up with Fred. So the stage is the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, so this is a kind of a big question for me. And I, I want to start before I formally introduce myself with a, uh, I want to offer a land acknowledgement. Um, I work on the ancestral lands of the Wiat peoples, which includes the Wiat tribe, Bear River Rancheria and Blue Lake Rancheria. I live on the ancestral territory of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, which includes Chalamella, Wind Valley and Kalapuya. To recognize the land as an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory we reside on and a way of honoring the indigenous people who have been living and working on the land from time immemorial. It's important to understand the long standing history that has brought us to reside on the land and to seek to understand our place within that history. Land acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process, and we must hold ourselves and the organizations we work on behalf of more attuned to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples where we live, work, and organize. And I invite you all to also offer your own land acknowledgements uh, where you live and work in the chat. Here's a resource to help situate you as well. Um, I. I, I want to get to the question, um, but I think that it also it sort of calls for me to ask um, or to kind of share a little bit of kind of my background and thinking. And I want to focus perhaps on like where we could be going with this work. And I'll share a little bit about that in a second. Um, my name is Nicola Walters. I use she, her pronouns. I serve as the membership and organizing chair for the California Faculty Association. I'm also a lecturer of politics at Cal Poly Humboldt, formerly Humboldt State University, which is a Hispanic serving institution and one of the 23 campuses in the California State University system. Before COVID, my teaching position also consisted of employment across three campuses, one being Cal Poly Humboldt and the other two campuses being part of the California Community College System at College of the Redwoods main campus in Eureka, California, and at the Klamath Trinity site on the Hoopa Reservation. And I'm really incredibly honored to be asked to speak today. Uh, I wanna thank all of our Hulu organizers for putting together such an incredible summit. I have been moved and inspired by this building conversation and the contributions made by our presenters and attendees. So for my part, I really wanna share a little bit more about my journey to Hulu and then offer some thoughts about how we continue to build this movement. You've already heard from many of my colleagues throughout the, the summit about our anti-racism and social justice work. And so I hope to kind of offer my positionality of why I think that this is really fundamental to our work and how it can, can continue to help us to shape this movement going forward. I work as a teacher, uh, or my work as a teacher and labor organizer has really been profoundly shaped by experiences working on campaigns across the United States prior to my employment in higher education. And my first work in organizing actually was on environmental campaigns in Colorado. I then began working for indigenous rights issues, food access for the unhoused, and immigration reform in Northern Arizona. I then worked in electoral politics, and I used to make the distinction between environmental, social, and political efforts, but my organizing experience has since taught me otherwise. I see each of these areas as interwoven into the work that we do and instrumental to our collective future. While I was a graduate student at Northern, in Northern California, I founded a community coalition building group in Humboldt County to serve as a bridge between Cal Poly Humboldt's campus and the broader Humboldt community. And we worked to aid uh, CFA during the 2015-2016 contract fight. So that was my first introduction to labor organizing and then to address racial violence and houselessness impacting students, faculty, and community members. It was during this time that I came to understand two fundamental things. One being that coalitions are absolutely necessary if we want to address complex issues, even in small communities. And two, universities and colleges are not in bubbles. They are situated within communities. What I was seeing in my community was reflected on campus, and what was happening on campus was reflected in my community. If we are to change the conditions within our institutions, we have to engage the conditions within our communities and recognize the impact that our campuses have on our broader communities. And I really have seen that fundamentally reflected in the work that we've been putting together over the last four days. The necessity to see the connection between environmental, political, social issues and the role of coalitions and communities was really solidified for me during the fall of 2016. I went as a representative of my Humboldt community group and graduate program to Standing Rock. 
And I wanted to talk a little bit about Standing Rock because that was the first time that I had that encounter with stepping up to the dividing line between capital and the state. This is the first time that I put my body on the proving ground of democracy. Whereas Chase Iron Eyes said, I was able to feel very viscerally that the system was designed to protect capital and property, and that is all. His words really reflected my own experience, and I spent three days while I was there involuntarily weeping. I kept saying, it's windy, I must have dust in my eyes, but my heart was actually breaking and reforging in a manner that would change the way that I live, work, and organize. And it was during that time that I began to realize my own limitations in my own learning, where the disconnect was between what I knew conceptually and what was really playing out in our country. And I looked upon the meaning of resilience in the 500 years of survival in front of me. I learned that even though I was an academic and an organizer, I was also a child who needed to listen and learn before speaking in communities outside of my own. And I learned what it looked like to be an ally as well as a co-conspirator. So since my experience there, I began to see that these front lines that we're coming into contact with are everywhere. And I can see more clearly what we're organizing against. Becoming a faculty member and a labor organizer exposed me to the precarity of academic labor. It also emboldened me to help make visible the experiences and the struggles of my students and colleagues. And this was a lesson from community organizing. I saw how necessary it was for us to use our stories to not only build our numbers, but also deepen our connections. Learning about each other's struggles is fundamental if we are to advocate for each other, build better contracts, unite on strike lines, and transform education. And so I want you all to think about all of this, you know, as we're reflecting on all these pieces over the last four days and how that relates to our own organizing work. Our long lasting membership building and organizing work is only possible in conjunction with anti-racism and social justice as a lens. And so we have to consider these different scenarios um, or sometimes using different scenarios has helped me to translate this to other members within our union. So first scenario, your colleague asks you, what does, insert union or organization do for people of my race, gender, class, sexuality, nationality, age, indigeneity, caste, marital, religion, disability, immigration status. These questions are organizing questions. You know, the second one, at a recruitment event, your colleague asks you, what does the, or why does the union or organization focus on social justice? You create an event and you have just white male tenured faculty attend. How might you change your approach? The fourth one, your students are working on a campaign to defund the police. You know students are integral to your organizing on campus and you want, to, you want to find areas for collaboration. How might you approach the student group? You attend a union event in your community where participants include agricultural workers, teachers, nurser, nurses, grocery store workers, and groups from other industries. You want to encourage other union workers to support your union organization, how do you approach this group? I mean, these are the types of scenarios that we come into contact with all of the time within our organizing efforts, and I could share more, but you, know, you get the idea that we have to be thinking about how we have conversations that connect to all of us. And I believe that is fundamental to where we move forward with this group. Um, it's important for us to build equity and inclusion within HELU. And so this is short term, you know, in our day to day practices, but it's also long term in terms of building a movement. Um, it helps us to build a movement on a state, on a local, state and national level. You know, we have to be considered about considerate with uh, our numbers, but also our relationships so that we have the ability to leverage change. You know, we can interact with using the numbers to help to make anti-racist and social justice transformations. We can also uh, use anti-racism and social justice work to allow us to build relationships to help us increase numbers. So these work in tandem with one another. When we build our relationships on campus and use relationship building to recruit new members, then turn members into organizers, or even if you're not in a union, you're trying to do the same process to build networks of organizers. Through doing this work, we lighten our personal workloads, we can turn out more members for events, we can demonstrate our power, and we can expand that bread and butter line of thinking into the whole buffet, to use Stacey Davis Gates contribution from yesterday. Ultimately, this is how we build a movement. We know the respective fights on our campuses, uh, that through all these respective fights, it's going to take a movement to make the changes that we seek. Going back to the beginning of COVID, faculty on my campus immediately responded with innovative and dynamic solutions to protect working and teaching conditions. Across 23 campuses, our CFA offered our way forward. 
All of last year, my colleagues and I spent lobbying legislators, building cross-union partnerships, launching petitions, organizing faculty labor in a desperate attempt to hold the line on faculty jobs at my institution. At Cal Poly Humboldt, we called it our push-pause campaign. We urged, just pause for a moment. Don't let lecturers go. Don't leave our community members without jobs in healthcare during a pandemic. Todd Wolfson was sharing the same experience at the beginning of the summit. You know, this is the conversation that we were having. We were urging folks to not turn to the disaster capitalism playbook. Let's build a new way forward with a new vision. But administration wasn't slashing jobs because of a lack of money or creative solutions. Administration was denying rights, respect, and justice because they, of more than just stepping off of the path. This was capitalizing on crisis. This was the path. At the end of the push pause campaign in April 2021, I was working to coordinate the second annual post capitalism conference where we had labor organizers from California, Oregon, Washington, Arizona, and New Jersey come together to discuss how workers were resisting oppressive neoliberal policies and practices in higher education. The focus was also on sharing resources to strengthen worker alliances and networks across institutions. This panel reinforced that we weren't alone and it brought together people who are behind the stories coming out of our institutions across the country that emphasized that we needed to unite. And now we're seeing HELU take form. And we've seen HELU subsequently from that time start to evolve into what we're interacting with today. So in a very short time, we've created a network across higher education that has allowed us to uh, imagine new possibilities. Ultimately, I'm no longer interested in pushing pause. I'm no longer interested in just holding the line. I'm interested in taking back education as a social good and a universal right. I'm interested in transforming education for students and workers on community college and university campuses, in medical centers, coaching, counseling, educating, serving, training, researching, aiding, healing, and forming the future of this country. What has been reflected throughout this summit is that in order for us to win, we have to build a structure. We need to cultivate real democracy that is rooted in anti-racist principles and weaves together the issues our communities face in our organizing work. We must develop an adaptable organization that can embolden our local fights, give hope to our workers, and win transformative national solutions. Even with CFA and the work that we were able to accomplish over an 18-month contract fight that was solidified with our CBA at the beginning of February, we know that this is bigger than California. And we know that if we're going to be able to see the solutions that our work has just begun to touch on within our own advocacy efforts, it has to go to a national level. For four days, we've heard of the struggles and successes across job sectors and education. We started to talk about equity along lines of race, gender, class, caste, sexuality, nationality, indigeneity, age, ability, and immigration status for students and higher ed workers across job categories. I am so inspired by, why, by, by what we are developing here. It is big. And I know that in our respective groups, we've been thinking about how huge this undertaking is. But what we're doing here is coalescing incredible amounts of experience to contribute to this work. We don't have all of the expert knowledge that we need individually, but we have it when we look around this group of a growing list of participants on a Sunday evening, afternoon, wherever you are, that are trying to define what it looks like for higher education in this country. It isn't going to be easy, but this is where we define and defend the future of our democracy. So let's take these lessons from our summit, recognize that we need to integrate them into our own actions while building a powerful national coalition, wall to wall, coast to coast, and let's win the future that we deserve. So that's what I have for you. So that's my question. I don't know, I think that's where we're headed. <laughs> wow, let's all go off mute and just... <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Nicola, Nicola. Nicola, that was so powerful and you um you gave it to us i mean that that's that's our framework that's how we're going to move forward and thank you for all your leadership nicola Hila would not be here if nicola were not here i mean you, you have been at the core of this leading us from day one so thank you and cfa pleasure. and yeah, let's keep going um, together. Uh, I'd like to invite 
uh, a spotlight to Fred Cole, another another man who's been there from day one um, with his union UUP. Fred, I'd like to ask you the same question. Um, what's what's in this moment for us? Why are we here? Uh, and where do we go next? And how it's happened to that? Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Um, and uh, Nicole, I don't know quite how to follow that. Uh, that was remarkable. Um, and and I will try. And, and it's ironic uh, when I was putting my uh, comments together um, and, you know, putting thought to paper, um, virtual paper, um, the first thing I wanted to start with was land acknowledgement. And so thank you uh, for uh, really uh, bringing that necessity uh, to the forefront for all of us. And so I extend greetings to all of us who are gathered here virtually, literally across this country, from the land of the Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse, specifically the keepers of the Eastern Door, known to some of us as the Mohawk Indigenous Nation. I don't make this statement just to make a statement, but to begin where I must, if I believe we have to be, if we are to be true to the themes that we've been talking about, and, and here's the way I've seen it, and here's the way I've felt about the work I've done with, with UUP, and that is that those of us in unions must make our unions more than just a union. We have to be part of the global struggle for racial and environmental justice. And that's got to take us out of our comfort zones and our traditional places. That means to begin to remind all of us and ourselves that the oldest struggle for justice in our nation is that of the indigenous people, and it's ongoing. It has, it has never paused, certainly as it ended. In fact, I was reminded that today is the 49th anniversary of the start of the occupation of Wounded Knee by the Oglala people and their allies. Uh, how fast time goes, and yet the struggle continues. But you know, there's another struggle that's ongoing, and that is the fight to find or to win justice for the over 1,000 indigenous women who go missing or who are murdered each and every year here in the United States. UUP staff member Margaret McLaughlin, who is present virtually at this meeting is going to post the website of an incredibly effective organization in the chat. It is fighting day after day for our indigenous sisters and justice calls to us all to be a part of this struggle. No day can be wasted, literally because lives are at stake. So I wanna start with that so that we are really centered on what the nature of the struggle is that is greater than than all of us, perhaps, in terms of the work we do. But what do I mean when I say we've got to be more than a union? It means that we have to be certainly constantly fighting for better working conditions, better pay, better benefits through collective bargaining. That struggle is rooted in centuries of work by workers and activists. But it cannot be all that a union aspires to be. For UUP, and yes, it's always stated, it's the largest higher ed union in the country. But that doesn't mean a damn thing if that's all we are. We are called to make the fight for racial justice in our union, in the State University of New York system where we work, and for that matter, in our state and our nation. It means we are, we are called upon to take the lead in the effort to turn our world away from the worsening climate crisis we face, while also forcing our university to take a lead both in rejecting the destructive non-renewable energy path we've been on collectively for too long, and to develop the means by which communities of color can be protected from the impacts of the climate crisis events that are happening constantly now. That's the key, because communities of color are on the front lines of the crisis. The efforts that UUP has taken, and we are just really at the start, We've taken several steps that I'd like to share with you, and but then at the same time to challenge myself, all of us, and all of us who work in the workers' movement. I want to start with, with structural racism, and I want to start with structural racism within UUP, our own union. This past month, we took the first steps in a permanent journey, permanent journey, to raise awareness amongst ourselves of the racism that has marked our union and every union in America over the past century. We held panel discussions that featured scholars, 
experts from the communities in which we live and community leaders on topics ranging from the experience of black faculty and staff in SUNY to the ever worsening maternal mortality rates in the African-American community, which have gotten worse during COVID. From the foundation of the white racist political economy that is based in systemic housing discrimination to a call to action to be engaged in the fight to defend voting rights. And now the work becomes truly difficult and challenging because we start the next stage, which will feature a long campaign of workshops and training that will enable us to confront the racism in our lives, both personal and professional. I put no time limit on this work, except that it will be constant. And it's based on the principle that in order for racism to be confronted, we must begin with ourselves, our own critique of the world around us otherwise is illegitimate. At the same time, in our advocacy work and fighting for the funding of SUNY, we've included in all that work, the demand that our campuses commit the resources necessary to achieve the goal of having 25% of the faculty and staff at SUNY by the year 2025 come from underrepresented communities of color, black, Latinx, and indigenous peoples. SUNY is nowhere near where it needs to be on this one. Further, central to our advocacy has been the constant demand that funding for the incredibly successful educational opportunity program be increased. Here we can potentially get to some success this year because last year funding for EOP increased by 10%. There are indications it could grow by another 20% this year. Well, three years ago, we publicly called for EOP funding to grow by 25% by the year 2025. So just maybe, maybe. But why EOP? It is a central pathway to overcome poverty in New York and promote social mobility and one of the oldest, largest, and most successful college access programs in the US. The program has nearly 80,000 graduates and they graduate at rates exceeding the national average, even though these students come from under-resourced families and typically are underprepared for college. It's phenomenally successful and it is the most direct way I have seen in my nearly 30 years of higher ed work to end intergenerational poverty. That's why UUP supports it aggressively in our advocacy. It changes lives and works to bring economic justice into reality. And we've continued to make advocacy for SUNY's three public teaching hospitals central to our work, especially during COVID, not just because a third of our members work in them, but because they serve the public regardless of whether or not patients have the ability to pay. At the same time, training is going on there that will bring in the next generation of healthcare professionals. We've proposed expanding the successful EOP program to include medical education so that the worsening situation regarding the lack of people of color entering those, these professions can be dealt with and aggressively, it's got to be done. Now, second, the major other major area, UUP has in the past seven years taken up a strong stance regarding the climate crisis. The efforts have been on three fronts. The initial steps, very limited. We develop proposals and state policies that centered on SUNY. Back in 2015, during that legislative session, UUP proposed that there be a public funding in the development of baccalaureate program at SUNY's tech campuses, like the one where I taught for those 30 years in Cobleskill, that would produce graduates who could step into the green energy jobs of the future. Programs, though limited in scope, were created. And even then Governor Cuomo supported the idea, which shocked the hell out of me, but much more needs to be done. Building on that very limited success, UUP proposed a whole host of policies starting last year that would make SUNY a lead institution in the struggle to corral the climate crisis. We called for SUNY's capital projects to be restricted to only those which would bring the entire system, 64 campuses into carbon neutrality absolutely no later than 2030. I'd prefer 2025, but this is what we, we have targeted. In the short run, given that SUNY is 40% of the state buildings in, uh, under its control, we've called for an immediate reduction of SUNY's carbon footprint, 25% in the first year, accelerating thereafter. And we've been doing advocacy on single-use plastics, the end of wasteful, wasteful disposal of out-of-service assets, and a far too limited investment in the necessary staff to bring about the aggressive goals New York has established in the groundbreaking Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act that was passed just a couple of years ago. We've also expanded our proposals on the role campuses can play 
in the move away from destructive energy sources. From that start back in 2015, we've called for a more aggressive development of academic programs, from certificate programs to doctoral programs in the areas of sustainable energy use and climate crisis mitigation. We see SUNY as uniquely positioned to provide the training that the workforce needs to get the green transformation jobs that must be created if the transition to a sustainable future is just and equitable. This is especially true in upstate New York, where the Great Recession never really has ended. Further, to build on technological changes and energy use transformation, we've called for SUNY's campuses to be the core of community microgrids, both to provide electricity from sustainable sources such as solar and wind, as well as to be a place where storage of energy generated at homes and businesses can be utilized when needed. This will serve to delink communities from the inefficient massive grids in place that depend on mega sized generating facilities that too often depend on coal, oil, or now much more frequently natural gas. Lastly, we've called on SUNY to make one of its campuses the national leader in climate crisis mitigation. And that is the campus of the College of Environmental Science and Forestry. It's perfectly positioned for this role. Though it would elevate the importance of research and education focused on the climate crisis. It could also provide coordination for all the work that is presently ongoing throughout higher education just in New York. The parallel is how back in the Cold War, the government subsidized research that almost exclusively was used for military purposes. This time, let's do that. But the research and innovation would support life, not death and destruction. The second major effort UUP has undertaken focuses on legislative advocacy with coalition partners in New York. This includes our strong support, and we were the largest public sector union to do so of the previously mentioned CLCPA. As part of that fight, we joined with New York Renews, a coalition of social groups, community groups, political groups across New York State to get the CLCPA passed. It was a disappointing experience for me for one real basic reason. This all goes back to being more than a union. We were one of the few public sector unions and there were almost no private sector unions who joined in the fight for the CLCPA. What I heard from these other union uh, leaders who didn't wanna join were comments like, well, it'll cost jobs, that's BS. Or it'll take away funding from what we need say in school funding, or worst of all, it's not what we need to focus on, we're a union. So what? A union, even if it fights for a contract and that's it, is trying to build a better future for its members and their families. Without an aggressive addressing of climate change, what will that future be? And by the way, as the costs of climate disasters rise, well, where will the resources for public services like public education come from? But more importantly, unions from the start have claimed, claimed to fight for justice. The climate fight is about justice. As the impacts both of the disasters that strike and the carbon-based energy usage that causes them hit poor communities of color most severely. The cost in lives from the air pollution caused by non-renewables runs to nearly 300,000 people annually, with most of those in communities of color due to respiratory and cardiac ailments. This is why starting last year, UUP has worked in support of coalition partners to pass the Climate and Community Investment Act in New York. The CCIA would tax carbon usage while using proceeds to convert to sustainable energy and most important, invest in energy rebates in low-income communities to address the rampant environmental injustice of the present, unsustainable and destructive energy system we have. Lastly, UUP has also worked nationally through alliances with coalitions such as those pressing for the passage of the Green New Deal, the Thrive Agenda, and those aspects of Build Back Better that will address the climate crisis. This is where I believe the Higher Ed Labor Union United effort could make a really important impact. By providing a means by which faculty, professional staff, researchers, students, community allies could come together to advocate and when necessary, make good trouble as John Lewis used to say, while also serving to educate the public about the needs for and the advantages of conversion to a green future. We cannot wait for national unions, as important as their voices can be, to be the sources for the kind of change we need. Though they can be helpful at the national level, only with the power of grassroots activists from unions, environmental organizations, and community partners will the political energy needed be brought to bear on this crisis. 
I started with land acknowledgement. And it is about where we are, where we stand, and as a reminder of what was taken by force and genocide. But the struggle for justice for indigenous rights is linked to the struggle to protect the future of our planet for those who come after us. We could do much worse to, than to heed the wisdom of the Haudenosaunee and consider every decision based on its impact seven generations in the future. That's about 150 years. UUP is about to turn 50 years old. That means that what we do as a union should be considered in terms of its impact three times the life of our union. Long time, huge responsibility, goes with being a real human being and dealing with a real crisis. That won't take resolutions or making statements or simply making demands. It means building political power, building bridges to diverse elements of society, even those with whom we have serious disagreements on many issues while taking every step we can quickly. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, as Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu wrote. For now, I close with this, fellow unionists and colleagues. Reach into the soil, take a deep breath of clear air, ponder the night sky, and grasp the moment of change that we can bring into existence right here and right now, right where we stand. Thanks, be well, and let's get to work. Thank you. Um, that so much inspiring words and a framework to think through and 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 to know um, how to connect so many different pieces of this puzzle from um, indigenous rights to uh, to to anti racism uh, to women to health to to, to everything. Uh, I mean, you 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 were able to connect so much and I think UUP is doing so much and thank you for helping us see how Hilu fits into that project. Um, and thank you for being here. Really appreciate your leadership and your support. Um, and yeah, uh, thank you so much. We are uh, moving, um, you know, I'm actually in the unusual position of being ahead of schedule. <laughs> so um, I I'm a little lost for words. <laughs> But I think what I'd like to do is bring forward um, Todd Wolfson, the general vice president of my own union, um, who is uh, uh, going to introduce help me in, uh, help us introduce Naomi Klein, our keynote speaker. I'd also like to introduce Lena C. Sanker uh, into the spotlight, and if she's a, if she's here and ready, uh, our, our the one and only Naomi Klein as well. All right, thank you so much. So Todd, I'm gonna hand it to you to get us started here. Thank you, Ian. Um, so it's, so first of all, it's so good to see all of you. This has been quite a weekend and uh, here we are. Um, so it's my great honor to introduce uh, an intellectual and political leader we all know, uh, Naomi Klein. Uh, among many other things, Naomi is an award-winning journalist, a New York Times bestselling author. She is co-director of the Center for Climate Justice. She helped co-author the LEAP Manifesto, which was a blueprint for a rapid justice-based transition off fossil fuels, which was endorsed by 200 orgs in Canada. And then following that, she and many others helped co-found the LEAP, which was a climate justice organization that existed to inject new urgency and bold ideas into confronting the intersecting crises of our time. Most recently, Naomi is University of British Columbia's Professor of Climate Justice. And I have to admit, that's a painful thing for me to say because prior to that, she was the inaugural Glorious Dynam Endowed Chair in Media, Culture and Feminist Studies at Rutgers with me and many of us. Um, and what a treat it was to have Naomi at Rutgers as a colleague for so many reasons, from her political clarity, her commitment to justice, to her the wonderful Radical Supper Club she and Avi built uh, that we all enjoyed so much. Um, but Naomi's research and teaching, as I think many of us know, it takes place at the intersection of crisis and political transformation. She's looked at the ways that large scale shocks, shocks like economic crises and ecological disasters or terrorist attacks act as catalysts and accelerators for broad based social change. And 
these crises are all too often harnessed by capital and capital's allied forces, right? And conversely though, because we all see the possibility of a different horizon, Naomi's also helped us explore, has explored and helped us see ways that these large shocks can be harnessed to usher in progressive change with democratic and economic rights strengthens and policies protecting the natural world rapidly adopted. Um, Naomi is author of multiple books that have shaped the way we all think about politics and society, including No Logo, which totally changed my dissertation. Naomi, I don't know if I ever told you that. Uh, the Shock Doctrine, uh, This Changes Everything on Fire, and the book my kids have been reading and finished, but love, How to Change Everything, The Young Human's Guide to Protecting Our Planet and Each Other. I'm very lucky, Naomi, to count you as a comrade and a friend. Um, and tonight, as our plenary and the last plenary of this amazing HELU Summit, which has been focused on confronting the crisis in higher ed, Naomi will be in conversation with Kalina Sesanker, political director of the Four Cs, one of our great leaders uh, in the higher ed movement, and Ian Gavigan, who's an executive council member with me at Rutgers AUPAFT. Through this conversation, they and Naomi will help us see how our work here at HELU and in higher ed is connected with the current political moment. And I'll just say from my vantage, building on Naomi's path-breaking work in shock doctrine in particular, we know we're living through a series of crises. And we've watched and we've fought as our local institutions, and, and uh, Nicola was just talking about this in California, but, and, and Fred as well in, in New York, but we've watched and we fought as our local institutions have harnessed these mounting crises to move forward their agenda, their agenda to privatize what were public goods, their agenda to further commodify our pedagogy through these online classes, um, their agenda to alter our labor by disciplining workers across higher ed. That's their agenda and it's big and it's a problem. My hope is given the situation that Naomi and Colina and Ian can help us imagine how we harness this political moment to take the many struggles in higher ed across this diverse workforce and geography and turn them into one singular movement. So I wanna reappropriate the words of the right to the city movement. There are many movements in higher ed, but we need one singular movement for the future of higher ed. And I hope that's what we focus on tonight as part of it. And so with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Kalina, Ian and Naomi, and I'm so excited to hear this. Okay. Thank you, Todd. Um, I think I'm gonna just try to get us started. Um, uh, thank you, Naomi Klein, for being with us. Um, we're so good to have you here. Um, uh, I wanted to start uh, um, by just laying out a little bit of what we've achieved in the past few days and what we're moving towards, because I think it's really important to frame this conversation around what HILU is and where we're going. So the um, HILU formed in uh, early 20, uh, in late spring 2021. Um, in response to almost a kind of like accident of, of, of history, a number of unionists around in higher ed around the country began talking about how to leverage potential higher education legislation in DC that was on the table, the College for All bill, into uh, a labor bill that would do something about the crisis of contingency um in particular but also the the crisis of higher education more generally recognizing that there was an opportunity to start socializing and politicizing uh socializing the idea that we can politicize uh our labor crises as part of the general crisis of um as Todd laid out the, the attack on on the social state and 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 attack on us um over the summer and into the fall we took a greater formal shape or a vision platform which lays out a visionary um, uh, path towards a uh, higher education reconstructed as a public good and the public interest um, based on the uh, mission of research education and teaching as well as service to the community um, and we also launched uh, a membership building project around advocating again in the national political arena um, to try to, to try to put again the labor conditions, especially around contingency, but not only, um, into the national conversation about the big social spending bills. Um, obviously, we didn't win on that fight, but what we did do was build massively. We more than doubled our size. We got many new voices into the conversation. And sit over the past several months, we've been working to figure out what's next. 
And uh, leading up to and during this summit, what we've done is affirm um, a, a path forward for our movement, which is to build a national coordinating capacity around three core things, which began first with coordinating our organizing capacity on campuses, uh, on and across campuses at scale, at the national scale, as well as at every scale in between. Secondarily, a development and advocacy policy shop to say that it's actually higher ed workers that should be writing uh, and pushing the laws and the policies and the regulations that affect us. And then third, uh, a kind of political engagement organizing wing that is going to take on the, the question of how do we build political power, um, not just on our campuses, but more broadly to take on the fights that can't be won at the bargaining table, like eliminating college tuition, canceling student debt, um, uh, winning transformative things like the Green New Deal, uh, transforming our labor markets so so that we are reversing and overcoming the uh, the crises of contingency, um, of outsourcing, of downsizing, of 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 uh, speeding up, um, and not replacing workers, but upgrading all of our uh, conditions. So these these are the things that we're excited to take on. Before you joined us uh, at about five. Uh, uh, to around five o'clock, we affirmed this structure for moving forward as, as a, a coalitional anti-racist uh, organization that also wants to work um, deep and deeply and in community with the other movements that are setting the pace for social change. And we're especially excited to be here with you as, as, as a, an international leader uh, on many fronts, but especially helping to set the pace of, of how we're thinking about the politics of the environmental movement and the moment that we're in. So all of that is to, to, to lead to a question, which is we want to know <laughs> what brought you um, to organizing in our sector and in the climate justice movement. Uh, what and what brings you here today? Well, first of all, I'm, I just want to say how thrilled I am to to be with you and thank you all for for the incredible organizing um, that all of that report represents. Um, and, and yes, uh, Kalina um, and Ian, I'm excited to be in conversation with you. Um, I'm speaking to you from British Columbia, um, from the unceded territories of the Shishat Nation. Um, and I guess the answer to how I got involved in post-secondary organizing is you can't really be in the communications department at Rutgers and not <laughs> get involved. And so Todd, you will always be my, my union president. Um, even though I'm no longer at Rutgers and, and Deepa and, and just this incredible crew. So, it, it, you know, the job at Rutgers was my first job at, 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 a, at a university. I've been uh, writing books as, you know, on my own as a freelancer. And, and so this was my, my, my entry point. And um, it was always going to be a three-year position that got unfortunately cut short by the pandemic. But I think that being in conversation with this, with, with our union um, in this moment of shock, which yes, I've theorized, but it is different, you know, to live through a moment like that um, and have it sc scramble your own world. I mean, one of the things I think that COVID as we, as we approach the, the two year anniversary of us all being sent home, um, it, it, it was a bit kind of humbling for me as somebody who has um, reported from various states of shock um, and, and sort of imagined that I was immune to some of the brain scrambling effects of a moment when everything is shifting, right? Um, it's really different when it's your own world, right? It's one thing to go, it, to go to Iraq after the invasion. It's not your own family that's under attack, you know? And, um, and so I, 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 having a group of people to think with at Rutgers, to identify the various tactics that we were experiencing from the university administration, but from uh, the state government and the national government to have a set of demands. Um, you know, that's what we all need in these moments is um, we need a narrative, we need a story, we need community. And I think that, that what has been so hard about um, those of us who've been privileged enough to isolate um, is the isolation because we know that that we draw strength from from being in community and there's only so much that virtual community can do because we don't have those moments where we feel um, our power right uh, and 
there obviously was the huge notable exception of the racial justice uprising in the summer of, of 2020. Um, I find it, I mean, in terms of what brought me to climate justice organizing, I mean, I mean to be honest with you, I came at it from an economic and racial justice perspective in the sense that I was not a lifelong climate person, environmental writer. Um, I was actually working on doing some work on reparations and the anniversary of the Durban conference from 2001 and was sort of taken aside by a group of friends from Bolivia who said, well, we actually think climate is our best chance of getting reparations for colonialism. Here's why, here's the math. And I sort of understood that because of the highly, highly unequal and unjust realities of who created the climate crisis and who is on the front lines of its impacts, there's a quantifiable case for wealth redistribution that as the left, we must reckon with and understand. And that was like my aha moment where I thought, okay, this is like, I, I can't keep outsourcing the climate issue because this is actually potentially transformational. Um, so, I mean, it is, climate change is transformational, but the responses to climate change and um, can also be transformational. And so I met uh, Angela Navarro, who was Eva Morales' um, climate negotiator and WTO representative at the same time, um, because they don't have a lot of money for foreign affairs. And she had just given this incredible speech in 2009, calling for a Marshall Plan for planet Earth. Um, that would redistribute wealth and technology on a scale never seen before. So I think all of this work that we've been doing, you know, around the Green New Deal and the LEAP is really just playing catch up <laughs> um, with the, the, the climate justice vision that, um, that, that, that was coming from racialized communities in the United States in particular, and also places like Ecuador, uh, the Niger Delta um, and Bolivia. So that's a little bit about what brought me here. Thanks for that. So I, I wonder if you could just describe this specific um, political moment that we're in. You know, we've seen reactionary grass tops movements emerge on either side of our international border, right? With the Ottawa truckers and so on. We've also seen some sputterings of what seems like a bit of progressive energy um, in the new DC administration. And then there's this very specific moment when we know um, the devastation happening in Ukraine right now and, um, and, and the way that it might connect with what we're dealing with here. So, so how should we think about this political moment and where do you see it heading? Hmm. Well, thanks for that. And, you know, I'm just still thinking it through with everyone else. I mean, one thing I can say about those Ottawa truckers is that they really like in terms of the movement itself, it's not Ottawa, it's Alberta. That's where they come from. That's where the movement comes from. There was a sort of dress rehearsal for this convoy model a few years ago, pre-pandemic in a, um, it, it was originally called, and these are the exact same players who led this movement. They, they, it was called United We Roll. And it was a trucker convoy that, that went from uh, Alberta, Tar Sands uh, to Ottawa. And um, they were pro-pipeline, anti-carbon pricing, and virulently anti-immigrant and racist. Um, and so that was the that was the the connective tissue. And so, you know, even just a few days ago, one of the leaders of this movement, her name's Tamara Lish, was in court was in court um, facing charges for the Ottawa uh, um, uh, occupation, as it's being called. Um, and she was wearing an I Heart Oil and Gas sweatshirt. Um, this is who they are, okay? Um, and so if I think about what is the weird kind of connective tissue between this, this the, Putin as, as, as an autocratic leader of a petro state, nostalgic for empire, um, and Trump and Bannon and, and Tucker Carlson praising Putin, as they themselves, uh, you know, embody this nostalgia for not just, you know, I, I mean, a love for oil and gas, but but a love for what it represents in terms of totally unaccountable power, right? 
And so I think that the, and then just, I think it was just yesterday, Trump was praising the truckers. Um, and, and I think that there's, a, there's an American convoy and I apologize for that head for DC right now. Um, but I think the connective tissue is not just the sort of love of fossil fuels and the drill baby drill vibe, which isn't new, right? And predates Trump um, by a long shot, but it's, it's toxic nostalgia. It's this, um, whether it's nostalgia for empire or a nostalgia for a relationship to the earth that doesn't have to contend with consequences or limits that, that can extract without limit. Um, I think that that's why they see each other in like the truckers see, you know, are cheering for Putin and Trump is cheering for the truckers and praising Putin and so on. I think that that's in a sense, this force that we're up against globally. I mean, look, like Fernand Marcos's son is about to become president of the Philippines in May. He's polling at 60%, right? So this is not, an, and this is, I think, one of the one of the challenges in, in being in an empire like the United States is it's so all-consuming and it's so terrifying that it, it, it can, I think, sometimes... Um, uh, uh, prevent an external, like like an ability to see common threads internationally, um, and, and not to say that, that that nobody does, but that it is its own form of American exceptionalism. I think to not see the common ground around this, the nostalgia figures. Every country is different. Every country has its particularities, but there are these trends, and so um, you know that's that's how I see this moment. I also see. You know, I'm trying to understand how the shock doctrine is the same and different in a moment like this. And I think um, one of the things that we've seen that's worth naming, and I think uh, you know, as 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 people organizing in the education sector, we know that education is always a battleground in the aftermath of these um, of these shocks because we're dealing with people who don't believe in public education at any level, K through 12, post secondary. They don't believe in public education, and so it's always first on the list of attacks. Um, and so, it, it, you know, in New Orleans, we know that it became a laboratory for the charter schools. We know after Hurricane Maria, Puerto Rico, same playbook, right? What's been different about COVID is that they don't come right out and say we want to privatize, you know, the, the public schools. What they're what we're what I think is distinctive in this moment is the role that conspiracy conspiracy culture uh, and just absolutely rampant conspiracy theories that are coming at us from every direction is is, is such a powerful um, a, a tool for the people who would privatize education, right? So you, you create this chaos in the, in, in the public school system around masks, around vaccines, um, around school closures, you turn it into you know, this site of a culture war on top of all of the other culture wars about whether or not we're gonna reckon with the past. And, 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 you know, and this is the other, obviously, the omnipresent nostalgia for not having to contend with the violence of the genocidal violence of the founding of settler colonial states, right? And so, but but now that now the argument is, I want to send my kid to school, but you won't let me, or you're making your my kid wear a mask, and that's like rape. I mean, this is the whole discourse. And so then the same old recipes come out: vouchers, charter schools, give us the money, and we'll you know we'll we'll give it to private schools. So I think that that's that's quite clear in the in the um, K through twelve. And then you all know what's going on with post-secondary. I mean, it's it's austerity, um, and it's you know everything that Todd was just saying about um, uh, you know about about you know an, in, our intellectual property, which isn't how we think of our teaching, but it's how they think of it, right? It's how they think of uh, of, of 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 grabbing our lectures, and and um, and this is what. This is the opportunism of uh, that's happening around around remote learning. Um, so yeah, there's that. <laughs> so taking it back to your keep keeping it on the train of the sector, mm -hmm. um, but also trying to connect it and trying not to have the kind of imperial narrow mindedness that you kind of pointed out. Um, how would you talk to us about holding together, bargaining, new organizing, political action, advocacy, street protest, all the various forms that we um, are practiced in kind of operating in, in our, on our own campuses or in our own cities or communities? 
Um, how do we balance a, a kind of impulse towards a, that big tent approach, um, the multiplicity of tactics with the enormity and specificity of the crisis we're in? And how do you see like a kind of coordinating formation like ours, like fitting into that crisis and intervening? Yeah, no, I th think it's a great, a great question. And I, and you know, the reason why I think it's helpful to identify this common thread around toxic nostalgia, um, you know, whether it's critical race theory wars, um, or whether it's the way in which these, you know, grass tops movements are appropriating the language of the oppressed and sort of making words sort of totally lose their meaning, right? Um, you know, at, at, at what at the same time they're saying we're living apartheid, Jim Crow, or the Holocaust, you know, um, it's fascism, it's tyranny. It's like, there's not much left, right? After they're done with it. Um, but I think the reason why it's useful to, to identify this is that you don't be toxic nostalgia with like slightly slightly less toxic, more watered down nostalgia, right? So it's, I think it's striking that Justin Trudeau's first words on the international stage were Canada is back, he put his hand on his heart at the Paris climate uh, uh, negotiations uh, and then bought three pipelines or pushed through three pipelines. Um, and uh, and Joe Biden's first, first words uh, on the international uh, file were uh, America is back. Um, America will will lead again, um, and and so and and Biden represents nostalgia. Uh, you know the, this nostalgia for the, the this this mirage of returning to pre-Trump normal, um, which you know obviously is the is the soil that produced Trump. Um, and and where I am, Trudeau, you know, he's the son of 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 of, of a beloved uh, uh, prime minister, a sort of shadow, you know, so for the social media age. Um, so, what are we offering instead of that? Cons considering that that sort of um, we've got the liberal nostalgia versus the sort of ferocious uh, uh, nostalgia, and they're feeding each other. Uh, and they're feeding each other because there's always some truth, right, in what the populists are selling. And they are increasingly appropriating the anti-corporate discourse of the left. And this is what I find most alarming as somebody who uh, don't tell anyone, but I listen to Steve Bannon's podcast uh, quite a lot. And I'm struck that the kind of media analysis that they're doing, you know, they'll sometimes do a... Uh, an audio collage of like every CNN and MSNBC show that's brought to you by Pfizer. And it'll just be like, brought to you by Pfizer, brought to you by Pfizer. And it's, you know, it's this critique of big pharma and they're the ones doing the critique of big tech. And they're the ones, you know, who are talking about how these politicians are like the Davos class, right? Um, and of course it all goes into anti-Semitism and racism and all the conspiracies, but the problem is that because they go so far, I think there's a lot happening on the left. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't call it the left, but sort of the liberal end of the spectrum that is just reactive, like whatever they are, we can't be. So we cede all of this, all of this ground. So, I mean, I'll give you an example. You asked about the role of street protests. I mean, when I looked at, this, at the truckers, um, I thought I had a moment where I just thought, imagine if we'd shut down a city demanding an end to vaccine apartheid you know, a man, a, a, a demanding uh, lifting a patent, uh, lifting the patents on these vaccines that were, that, that were created with public funding. Imagine if we had, had taken to the streets like that. Um, and, and, and I think on some level, what we're seeing is, is the power of economic disruption. I mean, obviously we're also seeing police complicity um, and, 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 a, and a, a government that, that didn't take them on at first, um, but, economic disruption, the strike, um, is an effective tactic. And, and it's a reminder that it's a tactic that we need to use. And that's why, you know, as a Canadian, it was, it was alarming when, when Justin Trudeau invoked the Emergency Act, not because it wasn't an emergency, but because he invoked it, um, say, saying that it was because of the, partly because of the economic disruption. So what does that mean for the possibility of a general strike? What does that mean for, for, for our potential to to uh, to to stop to stop the machine because that's the only thing that's ever going to work. Um, so yeah, I think we have to be organizing in the streets, and we also need to be organizing in our workplaces and doing the kind of cross silo work that you're doing. 
but also the kind of forward vision work that you're doing, right? And this is why, like, listening to, to Nicola, uh, I was, you know, it moves my heart because I think that um, it, it if, if, if weak nostalgia isn't gonna, gonna be toxic nostalgia, the only thing that is going to is actually a vision for the future that is hopeful and inclusive and transformational and solves multiple crises at once, which is what a Green New Deal is. Um, and you know, the exciting, you know, the interplay with you know, members of the squad who took pieces of it to have a Green New Deal for, for public, for, for education, for, for schools, for, um, for housing, uh, for cities, for towns. I mean, this is what we need to be doing in every single sector, um, uh, talking about how we make this real and, and really building out a vision for the future that is coherent, that is cohesive, that people want to go to. And that is not nostalgic of, uh, about a past that never was, but is somewhere we have never been before and being very explicit. We're going somewhere we've never been before and that is exciting. What do you think about how the situation in higher ed aligns or connects with this broader justice movement and this uh, look to the future, especially in climate justice? I'm sorry, I was just getting distracted by the comment about Marx. <laughs> Anti-Semitism was the socialism of fools. You know, I don't know, Joe, is it Marx who said that or is it? Is it Lenin? I've seen it attributed to five different people. It, I am, there's a lot of scholars on this call. I'd really like to get the proper citation for this one. <laughs> I absolutely agree. Can you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'm asking about how, how our higher ed fight connects with um, other areas of the fight for justice, but certainly the climate justice. Struggle. Yeah. Yeah, you know, as Todd mentioned, I'm, I, you know, one of the things, the reasons why I, I, I um, took this position at, at, at UBC uh, is because UBC um, is one of these institutions, one of the institutions that declared a climate emergency. Um, but because of faculty and student organizing, there's some real muscle behind the declaration. It isn't what, just another empty, uh, you know, statement. Uh, there's very strong justice language in it about taking leadership from frontline communities, about being in line with the university's own uh, indigenous strategic plan and with the um, uh, and with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, and as part, I mean, I, I, my job only exists because of faculty and student organizing at UBC in the context of the climate emergency. Um, and part of that was. Uh, um, agitating for the creation of a climate justice research center that would be different from, you know, just kind of classic cli climate research that is proving that we are indeed in a crisis that is looking at different responses. This is research that is um, partnered with the most impacted communities um, and that it is in the service of a just transition and we're in the process of uh, of, of develop, you know, figuring out how we do that with limited resources, because uh, as usual with most of these types of institutional announcements, there's more words than money attached to it. Um, but, um, but I, you know, we're, we're we're looking at partnering with 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 different folks across the border around uh, themes like climate reparations, coming back to what I was saying earlier of thinking about how we connect land back with reparations for slavery and colonialism um, and, and other forms of, of segregation. Um, and I think that this can be you know, really exciting research. Um, so there's the research piece and there's, you know, there's lots of research that we need to do um, you know, around the intersections of housing and climate uh, for instance, I mean, we're in a, we're in a housing uh, uh, emergency, we're also in a climate emergency, how do we multitask, right? Um, because right now the intersection of those emergencies and uh, emergencies uh, uh, of exclusion and, and racial injustice are meaning that, you know, when it floods in New York and New Jersey, you know, we know who dies, we, we just saw it, right? It's people, it's overwhelmingly immigrants living in in, in unregulated basement apartments because the only thing that they can afford even though they're holding down three jobs. Where I am, what it looks like is we had a heat dome in June um, and 600 people died, which is the most lethal uh, weather event in our country's history. And they were overwhelmingly people living in cramped apartments without ventilation, without control over their heat. And so some of their landlords, um, uh, so at least one landlord, kept the heat on during the heat dome. 
um, to try to, the, the tenants believe, to try to drive them out. Other tenants seized air conditioning and, and, um, and fans, right? So like this is climate change. I think as, as scholars, we need to be doing this kind of research to because there's not nearly enough of it in terms of really understanding what the intersections are and what the policy solutions should be. Um, but the policy solutions are not gonna be one without a movement, right? Because it's not like they don't know there's a housing emergency uh, at a climate emergency. And this is where I think academia can sometimes get way too much in its own head where it's like, oh, we just need to like prove it one more time, right? You know, what I'm really struck by is, and this I think relates to the incredible work that you're all doing around just the class system within our universities and, and the stratification um, uh, uh, of that class system and, and, and what it means for, um, for, for freedom of speech, for, uh, uh, you know, for, but, but specifically for organizing. I am so struck to hear from graduate students, young scientists who feel like they don't have a right to have an opinion about, to even express their terror until they have tenure but they don't know if they're ever gonna get tenure. And they think, well, I mean, I, or like, I have to wait 10 years before I'm a, I'm, I can say something, but 10 years is too late, right? So I actually think that, that there's a way in which the right to fight for the planet is an argument about the right for everybody to have job security within this entire system. Um, and so this is sort of an, an unformed idea, but, but um, I, I, it's getting harder and harder to get to the point, as we all know, where you have the security, where you get to actually say what you think. And by then you've been so disciplined that most people you know, have lost the knack for it anyway. Um, and yet we are in this emergency moment where we need everybody's full-throated uh, um, uh, you know, strength and, and expertise. And, and, and we, need, we, you know, we really do need everyone. Thanks for that, Naomi. And I think this might be our last question. And I think it, could, it kind of fits in well with, with where you were just going. Um, but you know, as a coalition that's taking seriously, not just bringing together grad students, uh, adjunctified workers, um, uh, full-time faculty, tenure, tenure people, but also non-teaching staff, people who do all sorts of kinds of professions in our medical, in our academic and academic medical systems. Um, could you tell us, uh, give us some like parting wisdom about what it means to work in coalition across these kinds of lines and then what it means to build a coalition with coalition as a coalition <laughs> with them and 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 how should we be thinking about that nested and difficult work um in in the crisis moment as you so wonderfully laid out for us You know, I think I, I t honestly take so much inspiration from the work that, that you're doing. And, you know, I, I find myself thinking a little bit about my experience in the in the Sanders campaign, which is what I was doing, you know, right before we were so rudely interrupted. Um, and just the sort of, I mean, look, I know not everybody's Bernie fan on this call, I'm sure, but the, the joy to me of being part of that campaign, and I was, a, you know, I, was a, I was a Sanders surrogate and got to go to, you know, five states. Um, was just the joy that people had in showing up for people and just that sort of moment, um, not to get too Bernie nostalgic, but you know, the sort of, are you ready to fight for someone you don't know moment, right? And I think that within our universities, we can create opportunities for people to find that in themselves. And that, you know, that, that, that's what the Bernie campaign unlocked. And he is not the only one who can unlock it. People really do want to show up for each other, particularly the people who they work with. Um, and they, and, and we are all kind of locked within structures that keep us in our little boxes and in our, in our silos and tell us that we should just, you know, work to protect our job category and that we can't uh, protect others. And that's what I think you're all exploding uh, in this organizing model. Um, and so, you know, and also I would just say uh, from a climate perspective, having strong visionary post-secondary unions inside the broader labor movement um, is very, very important because we've got some bad actors. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, those, 
and within those unions that are led by bad actors, there are lots of people who want something else, right? Um, and so the, the stronger you get and the more visionary you get in terms of bargaining for the common good and connecting the dots between all of these overlapping and intersecting crises, the more I think we will be able to um, you know, win some battles within the labor movement that are absolutely key. Because you know, I think there are some unions out there who are just falling down in their most basic responsibilities uh, to protect the future of their own sectors, of their own, um, you know, their own workers and their families. And it's scandalous. It is really, really scandalous. And 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 they have weaponized the language of solidarity within the labor movement to say, you know, you, you to basically treat treat people as traitors, um, you know, who stand up against pipelines or stand, you know, we saw this get really, really dirty in the fight against the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, so we need we need we need you we we need to be strong, <laughs> and we need to engage in those difficult battles within the labor movement and really empower the folks in those unions to democratize their own unions. Um, and uh, yeah, that's an important side of struggle. Thank you so much. What am I forgetting, Todd? <laughs> Not a thing, Naomi. Um, I, I'll just maybe take a second and then kick it back to you, Ian. Uh, one, Naomi, thank you so much on that last note. I, I think we've been we see this, that the labor movement in higher ed in this sector can be a critical piece of a reimagined, rekindled labor movement writ large. I think we all recognize the responsibility to bear there and that our work in the sector is critical and what it could mean beyond the sector is critical. So um, yes, thank you for, for marking that. And I'll just say to your point about people wanting to show up for each other, thank you for always showing up for us. Um, thank you. Um, for that, thank you for uh, being an intellectual that lifts our eyes up, um, and you know, thank you for joining for joining us tonight at this Higher Ed Labor United Summit. Um, just as you did at Rutgers, at critical moments to help us kind of reorient and figure out how to move forward. Um, I can't wait until we get to intersect again. Um, so I think we all just want to say thank you for tonight, and also our love to you and Toma and Avi out in BC. And Joe, to your point in the chat, is it that bad being in Jersey? Um, anyway, um, <laughs> thanks so much. I'll take it back to you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Such a pleasure. Thanks for all your work. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, pleasure to have you and have you with us as we, as we become an even stronger and bigger movement. Um, we're going to, we're going to move next to a panel um, so everyone show your appreciation to Naomi Klein before she leaves us. Um, thank you, Naomi, in the chat. Show us your clapping, give us your thumbs up, your celebration, your hearts, all of it. What a powerful and inspiring intellectual and, and organizing leader to have uh, right alongside with us. Thank you. We are... Um, we're gonna to move to a brief panel with a couple announcements um, from, from allies. I wanted to invite um, a few spotlights. Trent McDonald's gonna offer us a spot, gonna offer us an announcement on, on behalf of our, our good friend, Bill Herbert. And we'd also like to invite Glennis Lieb, international president of COCAL to join us. Thank you, Glennis. Um, Dr. Carrie Wentz uh, of the TF, FA was of, of the Texas um, uh, Faculty Association NEA was was supposed to be able to be with us, but unfortunately can't unless um, uh, un, un, unless Dr. Wentz um, joins us. I'm I'm going to go ahead and just give a, a brief preview. We wanted to give space for uh, representatives of of higher ed workers in Texas, um, both for the ongoing attacks on on workers uh, such as the, some who have even been with us. Oh, I'm sorry, Pat. Um, so we do, we do have one of our, um, uh, Pat Heinzelman will be here in, in lieu of Carrie's wins. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna shut up on that point and I'm gonna invite uh, uh, Pat onto, onto the stage. And so Pat, you've got, you know, 
three or four or five minutes if, if you would, could, could lay out what's happening in Texas and, and give us some announcements and some ways to support you from all around the country and even all around the globe. And Sean is gonna unmute you in just a second. Thank you. So what we have going on in Texas is our Lieutenant Governor, Dan Patrick, um, in response to a resolution filed by the University of Texas at Austin Faculty Senate to basically tell the politicians to stay out of the classroom, the Lieutenant Governor said that he was going to introduce uh, bills into the legislature in January that would stop tenure for all new faculty in the state. And if you taught critical race theory, he would revoke your tenure. So we've had a number of institutions that the faculty senate have filed resolutions in support of University of Texas at Austin since then, a whirlwind of articles in the newspapers and on television. Dan Patrick is, he's Republican, he's rabid like Abbott. And I believe he will give a good faith effort to go after tenure. So this yesterday, I met with the leaders of some of the advocacy groups here in Texas, uh, the AAUP, AFT, TACT. We decided that we would issue a joint statement closer to time. We're going to visit um, our legislators and do all we can to convince them to change their mind, visit the staffers for the legislatures, legislators. We're gonna send resolutions. We're gonna get more faculty senates to issue resolutions. We're gonna go on a letter writing campaign. Um, we're gonna hire a lobbyist, perhaps all, all of us together go in to have more impact. Uh, we're gonna have a coordinated media campaign. We're going to ask corporations to make statements. Do you guys have any further ideas that we might be able to do? Well, Pat, the um, what what we can do is be uh, be a communication channel, and we can um, we we would love to have you join us uh, in our next general meeting. We hold them on Thursdays and think through maybe more in more detail. But um, are there any things that we as individuals or as unions right now can or should do? Um, uh, or should we just kind of wait to hear from you as you as you all continue, continue to develop your plans? But we, we wanna show up and support for, for you. Okay, we so appreciate that. If I could get you to, for your different groups to send resolutions, um, may I send you the information who to send it to? Yes, absolutely. Um, and so we, we would love I, to share I, that with okay, our network. I can send you copies of like University of Houston's issued a resolution. Um, of course, University of Texas at Austin, Texas A&M, um, a number of the universities have. So I'll send you copies of all of those resolutions. Perhaps it'd be easy to put one together from that. Absolutely, and we'd be happy to help generate uh, a kind of um, one that others could, could repurpose and, and, and help you out in that way. Okay, we'd really appreciate it here in Texas. Absolutely, Pat. Thank you so much for, for your work and for the struggle. The struggle against uh, this is also, um, you know, as, as, other, as Pat and others have pointed out, this, this is about the so-called uh, crusade on, on so-called CRT, and really it's, it, it's, it's about beating back the anti-racist movement and beating back the movements for social justice. And so we all stand in solidarity with you and, and we look forward to supporting you. Thank you, sir. Um, so next I'd like to offer the floor to Glynis Lieb from, from COCAL who has two announcements for us. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. I'm so grateful to be here. Glenna Sleeve, um, she, her pronouns, and I'm coming to you from um, Treaty 6 territory in Canada. Um, Amaskochi, Wascahagan, um, also known as Beaver House Hill or Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. So um, I appreciate Naomi's talk and um, the comments about Alberta 
sting and ring true. Um, we're living that. Uh, we live in a province here who ha that has a long history of um, waging a war on critical thought and um, keeping folks um, overworked, undereducated cogs in the machine. Um, so I'm very grateful to be here. I'm also grateful to be here. I'm representing um, the um, Coalition of Contingent Academic Laborers. And um, we, um, we represent um, academic workers, precarious academic workers uh, in the United States, Canada, Mexico, and um, other countries in Central and, and South America. We've, we come together every two years typically uh, to meet um, and hold a conference to talk about the issues that are impacting precariously employed post-secondary workers uh, um, and that across these countries and we're hoping hoping to broaden our reach we've used this time during during covid when we couldn't meet physically to try to reach out to more folks from more countries and in the spirit of of what has been talked about extensively and brilliantly in this conference the idea that um, you know, as, as union activists, we need to look beyond our own locals, our own unions, um, our own provinces or states, and even our own countries. You know, this is this, um, what we're seeing happening, you know, to post-secondary education, to, to workers, what we're seeing happening politically across the world um, emphasizes the need for, for us to think bigger and think beyond ourselves. And so, um, uh, this coalition is one of the most rewarding experiences I've ever been part of because we get to meet regularly to talk to each other to talk about how we can help each other across, um, you know, across these um, fictitious borders that have been created and um, and get get beyond ourselves and that's again a lot of what what Naomi is talking about hit home there too you know we're very guilty in in the labor movement of um you know putting our own insular um isolated needs first and not thinking about the greater impact and um you know the greater well-being of all and it as many of you will know you know um, in the post-secondary world um, we're often guilty of not thinking of ourselves as workers and working people and um and that too so we have a lot of work to do i'm very proud to be part of cocal um and so i want to let you all know that we're going to be hosting um a car two-year overdue conference now um in Quetaro, um, Mexico on uh, August 4th to 7th, 2022. There will be a physical component and an online component. We'll be posting um, information within the next days or week or so, more details, but um, everybody is welcome. It's a very affordable conference, um, $180 US. And um, we also, and, um, our our local team in Mexico hosts it brilliantly every time they do it. We switch between Mexico, the United States, and Canada, so um, move from country to country every two years. And um, the team in Mexico always does an incredible job of, of hosting and entertaining and and teaching us about their country in addition to labor um, issues and and advance in advances. So we welcome everybody to please keep an eye on on this. Um, this conference coming up and and the um and um please reach out if you have any questions i put the link to the website in the chat already and so um you can reach us through there if you have any further education uh, questions the registration will be up soon as well um i also wanted to quickly share um, an idea that's been developing for some time now a number of um, since 2017 um, from our colleagues in um, in quebec um, Canada, and this is the idea of a continental day of action in defense of higher education. And they're looking at um, 2024. They've been working on, on this idea, as I said, for some time. We're looking to expand our reach and increase the conversations about this day of action and how we can make this happen globally in defense of um, post-secondary education. And so um, they have created this um, brilliant, they call it an, um, an octopus, a brilliant um, explanation of what they're trying to do and why 
um, post-secondary education is at risk. Again, many of these are factors that we all are aware of too. I'm going to share this because, um, because it is gorgeous. Um, it is in French. And so I'm going to upload the link for this um, Prezi that's in French um, into the chat for you as well. But I will also upload a Word document that is much less pretty, but translates this all the components into, um, into English. And so we can talk and basically talking about um, a knowledge economy and the commodification of, um, of knowledge and um, the impact that, um, you know, the commodification of knowledge and corporatization of post-secondary education is having on um, us as workers, on students and globally and, um, and highlighting the necessity for us to link together globally and take action. So I think I'm at the end, end of my time already. Um, I'm really grateful for being, um, being added here and being able to participate in this amazing conference. It's so, it's so um, beneficial to hear what's uh, happening with our neighbors to the south. And um, so thank you very much. I'll put these links in the chat and um, I will let you move to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Glynis. Um, it's really uh, exciting to have this emerging um, coalescence of, of uh, COCAL, which is a longstanding and, and critical organization in, in our movement and this newly forming cross category uh, coalition. So thank you for being here and thank you as well to all of the COCAL um, members who have been so active and, and key to, to forming and, and holding Hilo together and, and, and helping us envision what's next. Um, so thank you, Glennis. I want to I want to turn the stage over to Trent McDonald, um, without whom there also would be no Hilo uh, to speak of. Uh, and, and Trent, I know you have a few announcements you'd like to make. Uh, on behalf of both some uh, some others and 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 yourself as a Hilo leader, so the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, Ian, just to um, should I do the solidarity ask and then into my main like closing talk? Just yeah, for, please. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, good to see you all. Uh, I've seen a few of you in different ways, and so I'm, I'm happy to uh, get this distinct honor. And I do really think of it as an honor to help close things out. I'm Trent McDonald. I use he him pronouns. I'm an uh, English PhD candidate at Washington University in St. Louis and or usually organized with the WashU undergrad and grad workers union or WUGWU and then had been helping uh, facilitate a bunch of things uh, for our higher ed labor united summit. Just to uh, start immediately right with the solidarity ask, we now have uh, thanks to the great work of Tracy Berger and you know, campus workers of Colorado, um, this solidarity ask page where you can get more about uh, COCAL um, as, as we just heard about and um, the Texas Faculty Association um, stuff will soon be hosted too, but just um, from our good friend Bill Herbert, member of the Professional Staff Congress at the uh, City University of New York, that their National Center for the Study of Collective Bargaining in Higher Education and Professions, Hunter College at CUNY, is doing a survey on um, all of the sort of union contracts. And so if your union has not filled it out, we really need you to because it'll be open source and then allow us to continue to work to build and coordinate together. Um, and so that exact link on the solidarity page is right there. In addition, they're also hosting a teach-in, um, sort of continuing a lot of the themes that we've laid out across our past four days together on um, race, history, and academic freedom, a teach-in. And they're also hoping that this will spark sort of other teach-ins on similar subjects. And so there's that exact link. So please do distribute those as far and wide as you can, fill them out and attend respectively if you haven't um, yet RSVP'd or filled out said survey. Um, and then to pivot slightly into um, uh, the bittersweet, you know, conclusions of our summit, right? Um, we will also have uh, wonderful colleagues uh, to speak right after me. And so I'll try to be really brief just to work to wrap everything up to the extent that that's possible to do so. Just want to give a huge shout out to Naomi Williams, Evan Gavigan, Jewel Thomasula, Tracy Berger, Ariana Jacob, and Sean O'Brien for all the amazing work that they have put in, along with all of you else uh, who have worked to put things together, but they've really just gone above and beyond and put so much uh, effort into this um, exhausting and empowering, uh, wonderful time we've had together. And as with all of my um, you know, public speeches, I want to dedicate this to uh, my, my wife, Catherine. Um, so whenever I give remarks, I always want to um, give her a shout out. And so let me just start off by saying we have many challenges, right? We have a lot of hard work ahead of us, right? Um, it'll be fun. 
but it's going to be hard, <laughs> right? Um, like we must forge consensus and like unity through struggle. And so one of the people that I know has taught me a lot, right, and uh, reading and viewing her work is Ella Baker of the NAACP and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the um, SNCC, right? She's always a wonderful educator. She's a perfect concept for us here, spade work, right? The small repetitive acts that prepare the terrain for future struggle, right? They're necessary to build that consensus and unity, which begins with meeting people where they are, right? Like it's amazing how many hundreds of folks we've had on the call. We need hundreds more. And together we do all have 10 people we can move, even if you're a quiet, shy introvert of which uh, I self-define as typically. Um, and I'll also cite, right, as a model for us to follow, the total person unionism of Harold Gibbons and Ernest Calloway in my uh, new hometown of St. Louis, the Teamsters Local 688. And also jumping back to our first day, whole worker organizing via Jane McAlevey. So many of our speakers across our four days together have highlighted each of our issues are heavy lifts. And so we need all hands to move any of them. All hands, right? And to be clear, like things are quite bleak right now. To focus on the era I spend too much time, only about 10% of the American workforce are union members. And we lost 241,000 union members across the nation last year, just focusing on the US, bear with me. Yet well over 24,000 campus workers have won union recognition campaigns in the last four months. Um, including new unit organizing for um, the Student Researchers United, UAW at University of California, the Pitt Faculty Union, United Steelworkers, MIT Grad Students Union, UE, which can, um, United Electrical Workers is going to be one of the biggest campaigns of any workforce anywhere in the U.S., the U of New Mexico United Graduate Workers again with the UE, and the Indiana Grad Workers Coalition with the UE. Um, you might sense a, a bias in, in who I'm focusing on, of course. But also, right, there's the Miami of Ohio AAP and the ongoing SEIU faculty forward, right? We must continue to turn our movement around with as much new organizing as we can sustain. And with all the energy we've seen in campus workers organizing this year, we believe Hulu can play a key role in channeling this worker uprising through an increase in our sectoral higher ed, right, coordinating capacity, following what strategies worked in the past, right? We're not, we're, we're doing new things in higher ed but other workers have done them and won extraordinary things, right? In the glory days of the Congress of Industrial Organizations at the largest employers in the world at the time, we had this highlight of the 1945 to 46 strike wave when the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, United Auto Workers, United Steel Workers, United Mine Workers, United Electrical Workers, they all struck these largest employers together along with many other unions, along with general strikes in Oakland, Pittsburgh, Rochester, and Stanford. The grand total, in 1945, there were 4,750 strikes involving 3,470,000 workers for 38 million days off the job. And in 1946, there were 4,985 strikes involving 4.6 million workers for 116 million days off, right? 14% of the American workforce built coordinating capacity, built alignment built solidarity and worked together to raise living conditions in ways they never had before. And they were not perfect. They had many blind spots when it comes to race and gender and, and sexuality and, and indigeneity, et cetera, right? But that was still something valuable and concrete that they built that we've lost, but not forever, right? That can be regained. And higher ed is a crucial site where we can do that, right? Just to work toward concluding, right? There are around 250,000 campus workers bargaining contracts this year. Tens of thousands more organizing for union recognition to win deeply and widely held issues. If we coordinated them, what can we win together, right? A final note and call to action then, you know, continuity. We need you to stay engaged and to keep bringing more folks, right? Together, we can build swarming solidarity as Peter Olney and Rand Wilson have ever written about. We can con continue to keep up the heat, right? continue to keep up building together. And so a very final note and call to action, right? We need you to continue to stay engaged and, and work to get delegates to your union organization, however you're self-identifying, to get them to continue coming, right? So that this is a sustained organization that we don't lose what we've already built thus far, but instead keep building it to be even further. Thanks for the opportunity to speak.
Thank you, Trent. Thank you for everything, including that incredibly important message about what coordinating capacity has meant um, and can mean, and for putting us in that context. Um, you're also such a unifier in our movement. I feel like Trent is constantly having one-on-ones and calling everyone and holding us all together in so many ways. Um, and in the spirit of Trent's final comment, I wanna urge um, every union, AUP advocacy chapter, and voluntary membership-based work organization that has sent people to this summit um, to make sure you've identified a delegate to send, or, mo or multiple delegates, to send to um, HELA's regular meetings. Um, and so if you haven't done so already, please make sure to communicate to our outreach team. Um, Jewel is our leader, but there are many of them, of us. Um, reach out and, and let's make sure you get uh, a delegate ready for, or more or more than one ready for our meetings. We have one final panel, which is a panel looking forward. Um, and so I'd like to call for spotlights uh, on, on Marisa Chappelle, uh, Naomi Williams, uh, Ariana Jacob, uh, and uh, Tracy Berger. Um, Marisa, you, uh, I want to give you the floor first. I want to give you some, a little a little room to move, and I want you to tell us who you are and what you're excited about for coming out of this summit, what you're looking forward to, uh, and what you think we can we can should do together. Thank you, Ian. Uh, like Trent, I'm I'm really honored to be asked to address the group. Um, I teach history at Oregon State University, and I'm an activist with United Academics of OSU. Um, it's a union of academic faculty, both full and part-time across our campuses. Our union was certified on June 27th, 2018. If that doesn't mean anything to you, that's the day the Supreme Court handed down the Janus decision. I'm joining you from Corvallis, Oregon, located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's River or Ampanepi Band of the Kalapuya, who were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon and whose living descendants are part of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde community and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. Um, I'm a historian uh, of American labor, social policy, and social movements, and I spend a lot of time learning about the activists on whose shoulders we stand, particularly organizations and campaigns led by women of color whose critiques of racial capitalism and of the profound injustices embedded in the American and global political economies must always lie at the center of our work. Their commitment to economic, racial, and gender justice, to a robust and egalitarian public sector, and to an expansive, inclusive, multiracial democracy is our touchstone. Studying and writing about these activists has helped to sustain me over the past several years, years when many of us who hold positions of privilege have woken up in new ways to the profound threats we face to democracy and to justice. But so has the opportunity I've had to become an activist myself, to participate in organizing and building my faculty union and bargaining our first CBA, uh, work to try to mobilize faculty senate colleagues to expect and demand more power in our university to forge coalition with staff and graduate unions, undergraduate students, non-unionized professional faculty at our campus, and to strategize with colleagues in scholars for a new deal for higher ed in Labor Notes Public Higher Ed Workers Group with debt collective folks like Jason and Elaney, with all of you in Hilu about how we can transform higher education into a universal right and a social good that operates in the public interest. So I don't wanna repeat a lot of things. I just wanna, for a few minutes, talk about what's at stake. What's at stake is big, right? This is urgent. What's at stake are human rights. What's at stake is democratic governance, the ability of all people to survive and thrive on planet earth. We face a choice right now. We can continue toward a world characterized by authoritarian regimes, by vast inequalities of wealth, health, and living standards, by growing precarity and constricted opportunities and outcomes for more and more people. Or we can build a world characterized by robust democratic governance, racial, gender, and social justice, a world where all people have access to economic security and the chance to pursue their highest aspirations. So we must continue to build a social movement. What is it that social movements do? 
they change and expand people's sense of what's possible. They allow us to collectively construct and fight for visions of freedom and justice. They build solidarity and commitment to winning change through engagement in common struggle. This is what we need. This is our work. We've learned a lot of lessons over the four days of the summits about the importance of building relationships and coalitions across difference, about centering the needs of the most vulnerable, about centering racial, gender, and social justice, about framing our vision in the broadest possible terms to speak to a majority whose interests and aspirations will in fact be served by the transformations we're seeking. We have to work on every front, every day, to articulate and fight for our vision because there's no other choice. And I so look forward to continuing this work with all of you. Thank you, Marisa. We are so excited to keep continuing this work with you. Um, thank you. I wanna ask um, two of our coordinators who haven't had a lot of the limelight here to offer their perspectives. Um, they've put in so much time and so much effort. Um, and we also have our, our honorary coordinator, Eleanor, on the screen with us uh, as well. Um, but uh, I want to go first to Tracy Berger. Tracy, what, what would you like to share with us as something to take away as some as some lessons and some messages to, to hold with us? Um, so the first thing I want to do is, is thank everybody who worked on the media committee with me, um, specifically Alan, Amy, Helena, and Eric, who were all extremely involved. And um, Alan created lots of great graphics. And I think that that's, that's part of uh, what we need to look for going forward is this, this national group of people coming together and taking little bits and pieces of the work that makes things like this happen. Um, Cause that, that's, that's really what Hilu is about. Um, the thing I'm looking forward to um, is just being part of this movement and um, having, being part of, of not just the higher education labor movement, but the labor movement that we are labor, we are workers, we um, want, this not to just be about higher education, but we want this to be about workers across the board. Um, and uh, just developing understanding and building that power um, because there are so many of us, there are so many people who work in higher education um, in different ways. I'm personally a staff member, I'm a, an IT business analyst and I love getting to work with student workers, undergraduate and graduate with faculty. Um, adjunct, adjunct um, tenure track, anybody I can work with who will get on board and, and help with the work. Um, so just building that and getting more people involved, I think getting more staff involved is really important. Um, in particular, I think staff um, has, we've got a real practical view of how to get things done that can come in handy for a movement like this where um sorry um we need to, we need to sometimes uh get down to the practical nuts and bolts of how things will be will uh get done and i just also want to welcome anybody so we've got the three main uh policy subject areas that he was focusing on but that's also true um but we um have the media and communications group that um will continue to support this work and and uh, apparently um <laughs> that will continue to to support the other groups going forward um and anybody who wants to get involved with us is welcome to do so thank you so much tracy um, and for all you've done to bring your skills as a communicator um, and also to bring your perspective as a leader of, of professional staff. Um, thank you so much. Ar Ariana, could, could you help give, tell us what, you're, uh, what, you're, what you want us to take with moving forward? <laughs> Um, well, the first thing I want to say is that I'm sort of the newest member of the team and I'm only really I've only really been involved for about a month and I want to just talk about how welcoming this group of people has been and how like legitimately they have let my different way of thinking about things become a part of the way that the process goes and different just in the sense of like I'm 
I haven't been a part of all the shared conversations. So what I what I want to say is just um, how essential it is that we actually join this work. So there have been hundreds of us here together, um, but it will really take us coming together on a regular basis to keep this work going. And it feels good to be a part of this group. So let's 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 think about that as like a regular part of our life of how we can actually um, continue to meet, continue to be a part of this team together in an active way. Um, and it feels good. <laughs> That's what I want to say. And then I'm also hoping that sometime we actually get to get a drink together or have a party together because um, that would be nice too. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, Ariana, for bringing a new and newly and sorely needed perspective to the organizing team. We're, we're really lucky to have you and to hold on to you, I hope. Um, uh, and good call on getting to hang out. Hopefully, maybe, maybe we can join CoCal this summer in Mexico. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> we're, we're nearing the end. And I just wanted to invite Naomi, um, another, another of the co-conspirators here, to offer any closing words for us. And, you know, I feel like I took a lot of space over the last couple of days, um, so I'll keep it short and just say thank you, everybody, for showing up, for doing the work. You know, I really appreciate what Marissa said and echo all of that. Um, Marissa is one of the people that, you know, as a historian, I've looked up to and I saw her name as a part of this group. And I was like, oh, sure, I'll check it out because, you know, there's some good people in there. And it, it's been amazing and to be able to get together with people and do this work this is what it's about right this is how we get free and i think we heard it from day one until today right we have to move together to do this and this is this is what we're doing so proud of us so excited for this and i'm gonna take a nap <laughs> for a long time a well-deserved nap thank you thank you naomi um I, I feel like we've all just been saying thank you and that's okay. Like we, sh and it's so good to be able to appreciate each other and to appreciate not just the people who organize this, but the people who have been, um, or, you know, organizing with Hilo, organizing in our unions, coming to these events, taking part, all of us have made this happen. Not just the organizing team, all of us have made this happen. And um, all of us is the only group that can move this forward. So, I want to reiterate what everyone has said and reinforce like get if your union hasn't yet endorsed get them to endorse if your union hasn't yet taken a look at like i guess none of them have because we haven't sent it out but once we send out the uh, affirmation the statement of what's next today you get your union on board get your aup chapter on board if they aren't already we need everyone we need you we need all of us and don't just get people to sign on, but make sure that you appoint delegates, make sure you appoint, appoint people, because this work requires many hands on deck and it requires people coming to our organizing meetings, staying involved, staying in touch, and really moving forward together. Um, so we have info at higheredlaborunited.org is our general email address. Uh, many of us are in contact with you. Jewel, our amazing outreach facilitator, has has talked to so many of you. Whoever your point of contact is to Hilu, let's like, we're gonna follow up with you. Um, and also please follow up with us um, because we need to stay connected, we need to grow. And we are going to stay connected and we are going to grow and we are going to build a higher ed labor movement wall to wall, coast to coast to transform our system of higher education and to use that transformation to make a bigger, broader transformation um, in this country and in this world. Uh, only together can we do it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your work. Thank you for being here. Um, you'll be hearing from us and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.